We hear the phrase working mom constantly. We don't really hear the phrase working dad. And just as one example, I Googled, you know, with the quotes to get it right, working mom, 2.4 million hits or so. I Googled working dad. Any guesses what I got? Movie? Movie hmm? <laughs> <laughs> No, no. <laughs> 99,000 hits. All right, so 2.4 million to 99,000. I was not expecting that. I thought it would be kind of two to one, and then I'd say two million to one million. 2.4 million to 99,000. So the question is, what does that mean? I think it means a couple of different things. For men, it means that fathers don't have a culturally accepted, clearly defined set of norms to integrate the various aspects of life. On the other hand, there's no expectation that working dads will actually be good dads or that being a dad will get in the way of your work. No one expects that that's going to be a problem. Women, of course, face the entirely opposite and I think much more pernicious problem. Men can't integrate identities. They don't have a way of doing that. Women can't disentangle them. Working moms are inundated with these discussions, having it all, uh, leaning in. Now. But if you want to have it all, it assumes that all is necessary. It assumes that their identity as moms must always be present. And I think this assumption is something that has kept women, one of many things that has kept women from breaking glass ceilings. Mom, working mom always means mom. Meanwhile, people without children, and some of you look pretty young, uh, but maybe I'm just getting older, uh, people without children, especially in, in high pressure environments like this one, they feel required to work long hours to take every late or weekend obligation. And they often come to resent parents and not so much their children, but the built-in excuses that these children offer. These are ditch challenges. They're different challenges for different people, depending on your life situation. And I think they can't be met without dialogue, without open conversations. And it's my pleasure and hope to start off our conversation today. I'm going to begin with my own story. So I'm a working dad. My wife is a corporate scientist. She has very little flexibility in her schedule. She travels at least uh, two out of every five weeks, sometimes more, gone for weeks at a time. Uh, when it comes to the duties on parenting, I'm the first on call. Even when she's home. Yesterday, after we talked about this yesterday, I got to the parking lot, turned on my phone. I had multiple calls from the school nurse because my son had to be in his pants and they had, didn't have extra pants. So I was in Evanston. You all know how long it takes to get from Evanston to the western suburbs? Maybe you don't. It's not, a, it's not a quick drive. My wife was nearby, but at a conference. And we, we had a diet. Uh, we had a diet. I'll, talk more about that. I'll talk more about that going forward. So when it comes to the duties of parenting, I am the first on call. But I also work very hard. I do have tenure now. I work very hard to get there. I have a book on the way. I chair a committee. I serve on other committees. I write popular essays. I advise students. I teach lots of classes. I chase work-life integration as a kind of platonic ideal. It's a target. It's always out of reach, but it's a target. I do have some strategies that I think help me make chase. First, I work very hard to identify the patterns that connect my diverse and sometimes conflicting elements that make up my life. Second, I try to be very intentional in my relationship, my partnership with my wife. And third, I speak out. I speak out, not just here, but in many ways, as a public father. And by putting all these strategies together, I try to integrate my life, to see it as a whole, and then to answer what I've come to believe is the most important question. What's next? I've come to this question in my approach to work-life integration entirely by chance. I wasn't planning on this. This was not a role I thought I would be in seven years ago. Um, really, it's a process sparked by the copying of an extra chromosome in the moments after my son's conception and then my reaction to the words Down syndrome. So now you know a little more about it. So the last time I wasn't born about integrating work and life was in the summer of 2006, which are literally several lifetimes ago. Not my lifetime, but several lifetimes ago. I was working on my dissertation. It was great. I had a desk. It looked out over a stream. There was wildlife. I would wake up in the morning. I would sit down. I would write 2,000 words, however long it took me. Then I would shower and eat. I'd go back and edit those 2,000 words. I did it all summer. I wrote my dissertation. It was a beautiful time, intense concentration on one project about which I cared deeply. I turned in my dissertation. A week later, we discovered my wife was pregnant. Good time. A week earlier, two weeks earlier, it might have been on. A week later, we discovered she was pregnant. 
My son was born a few days after my first round of job interviews, and by the time I came to Chicago for my final interview with Dominican, uh, we had had his diagnosis, because he was diagnosed just a few minutes after his birth. So I decided when I arrived here to tell my prospective employers all about my newborn son's condition, because I wanted to ask about special education, special recreation, and gen therapies, and medical issues, and a whole new range of questions I had that I hadn't considered before. So I said, the only way I can really assess this job is if I'm open. This was not a decision I made lightly. It was a, it was a choice. It was a strategy. And it may, it may seem risky to be so open, or I would say even vulnerable, when on a job interview, right? You're selling yourself. You now let me tell you about my son with Down syndrome and all the needs that I might have. But it's worked for me, and I'll tell you a little bit more why. And I want to recognize, though, first off, that I do have this advantage. I'm straight, white married man. So when being open and talking about family, I'm taking much less of a risk than other people. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more about that later. But I don't want you thinking, well, of course you do. He's a guy. Right? I know that. And we'll talk about it. <coughs> so I like to think I would have been a good engaged father of any child with or without Down syndrome. I'd always wanted children. I think I would have been a good dad. But there's no question to me that when Nico was born and diagnosed, it changed me. It pushed me into a new life. This is not unusual. I know many men, men who wanted to be fathers, but who never expected to be carriers, for whom their definition of what fatherhood was, their ideal, their imaginary life as a father, didn't overlap with this notion of caregiving. I've seen that change very rapidly. I see it change for many fathers, but I've seen it change very rapidly by the birth of a child with Down syndrome or with another disability. I've also, I should say, seen men unable to cope with it, to turn away from the child, sometimes for a few weeks or months, sometimes I think permanently, unable to reconcile the ideal with the reality they're facing. But for me, and for many parents, the process of adapting to, to this diagnostic reality pushed me. It was very time consuming. It engaged all of me all the time, uh, learning about potential and current health issues, filling out paperwork, arranging for tests, more tests, more tests. We have, I don't know, eight hearing tests in the first six months, uh, just as one example. Meeting an ever-expanding team of doctors, starting therapies in and out of the home, and so on. A lot of this stuff may sound like typical birth. There's lots of tests, there's lots of doctors, there's lots to do, you're very busy. It is like a typical birth. But the complexity of the situation and the amount of work that goes into it, not just physical work, not just paperwork, but mental work, Learning about a whole new world for which one was, at least I, was completely not prepared. Totally ignorant as I went into this. There's an enormous amount of mental work. It redirected my mind, my habits, and my identity towards care. In this process, I learned a lot about keeping the big picture in mind, even as I focused intensely on what's next. And when you get a child with Down syndrome, they give you a list of all of the medical things that might happen to your child, 99% of which are not actually happening to your child, just as one example. You have the big picture, you focus on the things that are actually happening now. What's in the next five minutes? What's the next test? What's the next thing? So that's what I mean. Well, the road from my son's birth to today has been complicated, as you might expect. The early years were really hard. We couldn't afford childcare, so my wife and I tag team. We lived close to the university. She went to school, she went to work, I went to class, I came back home, back and forth and back and forth. Right now, I can't tell you things are less complicated, but we do have two careers, a nice house, money for childcare, I did get tenure, I'm deeply grateful for all of these things. But in order to advance her career, my wife has chosen to be gone a lot. And I'm left to manage the complexities of the kids' transport, daily care, food, health, education, and all the other thousand little details. It's these little things, not just the phone calls from frantic school nurses, but these little things that I suspect many of you know make being a working parent uh, complicated. So here's my first day of the semester, but this could happen any week. 2 a.m., my daughter comes upstairs to tell me she has to go to the bathroom. My daughter has a bathroom right next to her bed. She can use it by herself, but she comes upstairs to wake me up to tell me she has to go to the bathroom. 4 a.m., my wife gets up, catches a taxi, leaves town for the week. 6 a.m., I get up, I get my kids up, uh, I get them dressed, I feed them breakfast, I give my son some medicine, I get their teeth brushed, I get them to the bathroom. Finally, my son is on the bus at 7.30. I drive my daughter to preschool, I go to work. 9 o'clock, I'm in my office. I teach all day. 
then reverse the process. I pick them up, I bring them home, I feed them, I undress them, I clean them, I put them to bed. And at 9 o'clock, I sit back down at my desk to start working. Class prep, writing plans, plans for the week, menu planning, whatever else I need to do. How do we cope with this? And I mean we as all working parents, but also me and my wife and I in particular. In my family, we cope with it by being as intentional as possible in organizing our lives. My wife and I don't pursue some sort of ideal equality of responsibilities in which we each do the same amount of tasks. I have this idea of tracking hours on a chart so that you can you know, say, well, I've worked 12 hours on the kids and you've worked nine hours, so you have to go give the kids a bath now, right? We don't. That's not, we don't do anything like that. Maybe other people do. Uh, what we really try to do is not to make assumptions about who should do what. And I think these conversations about well, who should do what, being intentional, not make an assumption, have led us past the pitfalls of the mommy trap, in which traditional gender roles, or really perceived traditional gender roles, function as a kind of default. For us, there is no default. There is only conversation and compromise. And Google Calendar. <laughs> I cannot emphasize this enough. This is not a tips. This is not a tips talk. I'm trying to get to some big ideas. But if I have one tip, Google Calendar, we always, we always know where we're going to be. It might have saved our marriage. Uh, because we had so many fights about who should be where when. Now it's just a matter of record. Sometimes we're in the wrong place. Sometimes we blow it. But we just have this matter of record. And we chat all day because no one is free. Neither of us are ever free at the same time. But we have lots to talk about organization. So little tech tips that you have. Well, it's not so easy, despite Google Calendar, just to discard traditional gender roles. Would that ever work? They permeate the meeting we consume, the media we consume. They permeate the messages we hear. They shape our subconsciousness. I'm not immune to these pressures. I wish I were. But I do try to work against the grain by explicitly linking my sense of my own masculinity to everything I do. Making dinner, doing dishes. I say these things are manly. Going to work, picking up a paycheck. I say these things are manly. Fixing the house, tending the garden. These things are manly. Washing my children, wiping their bodies. These things are manly. I'm not saying they're only manly. I'm not saying they're only masculine. What I'm saying is that they can be part of an inclusive masculine identity. Well, I used to just say this to myself, particularly after disasters in the bathroom or in the bedroom or in the diapers or in the bed. Wiping bottom, this is manly. Uh, kind of a mantra getting through some of those dark nights, let me tell you. A, bathroom ex uh, a bottom explosion at 2 a.m. is not, it's happened to every parent, it's never occurred. Uh, those are the moments in which you wonder what you've gotten into. So I'd say it to myself, help me through these tough moments. But in the last year, somewhat to my surprise, I've taken on this new position, public father. 